Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Poplar Corner Baptist Church. Uh, thank you for being here this morning on this, actually the first Sunday of December. And uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, as we continue with our Christmas celebration, as we began last week, we have a special uh, guest this morning that's probably not a guest here anyway. Uh, Molly is going to be playing for us along with her mom, Kim, uh, for our prelude, and I hope that you'll listen and worship along as they play for us some wonderful Christmas music, and then we'll go from there.
listening to us every Sunday. And we appreciate you. What a nice crowd today. Beautiful day outside and just a great spirit here. I can feel the energy and sense the presence of God. I almost feel like I need to take my shoes off because we're on holy ground and we're going to hear the voice of the Lord today and we're going to lift up His name in praise. We're going to sing with, with reckless abandon. Don't hold back. The Bible does not say make a beautiful noise to the Lord. It says make a joyful noise to the Lord and all of you can do that, I guarantee. If you're a guest, we're especially grateful to have you uh, you're not a visitor. You know, that implies outsider. You're a guest. We love to have company. And we're glad you're here and, and hope that uh, you'll want to come back and worship with us again. Let me just uh, remind you of a couple of announcements. We are continuing to receive our Light Moon Christmas offering for international missions. The need has never been greater. The opportunities have never been greater. So you give as generously as you possibly can. Also, you know about the shower for Alan and Bobby this afternoon. The post office boxes are out there. Rather than giving your 55 cents to the government, uh, give it to Lottie. Just use this as an opportunity to share your Christmas cards and uh, give whatever you would have spent on stamps. Uh, next Sunday night is our church-wide Christmas fellowship. We're going to begin at uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, just bring some finger foods, uh, sausage balls, um, and uh, you know, dessert, and we'll have a great time together. The Christmas breakfast on the 15th is still on, but I was by there last night. I noticed they're not doing the buffet right now. They're just doing the, the family style. So I hope that won't discourage any of you from coming, but it will be a little different. And the price is still around $10 or so. Uh, youth and children, don't forget your special trip. Mm -hmm. Going to go to Jackson to the baseball stadium. Then come back and look at some lights here in Haywood County. Uh, on the 20th, which is two weeks from today, that morning we will have our uh, Christmas music by the choir. They've been working hard. We have a wonderful conductor, director, and we look forward to sharing that with you. Uh, as far as prayer concerns are, are, are involved, uh, Charles Seals, as you know, died on Friday. Uh, his service is tomorrow at 1 o'clock at Brownsville Funeral Home. They're going to have a visitation, I believe, for two hours before. And then I've got some wonderful news to share. You know that uh, Belinda Bird had a pretty major stroke uh, Friday night at work, and she was totally paralyzed on one side unable to speak. In fact, it was her fifth stroke of the year. But I talked to Danny this morning. Uh, she's now able to move. She's now able to talk. That happened uh, simultaneously as our Sunday school classes were praying for her. That just sends cold chills up and down my spine to think that God immediately answered our prayers. It looks like she's going to be okay. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We're grateful for the spirit of expectancy found here. Uh, Lord, we know that we're not going to be disappointed. We also know, Lord, that we will get out of this service exactly what we put into it. So I pray that we would lift up our voices in song, that we would give as generously as we possibly can, that we would listen as your word is proclaimed. Uh, I pray, Father, that People would not hear a human voice this morning. I pray that they not see a human face. We want them to hear the voice of God and see the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up in all of His glory. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for answered prayer with regard to Belinda. And I pray that they would be able to determine what is causing all of these strokes. I know that they are grateful to be part of a praying family. And we're so grateful for those who uh, give of their time and their efforts to reach out to people who are, who are hurting. They take food. They send flowers and cards. This is such a caring and gracious congregation. And it is such a privilege to be part of it. 
So, Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are continuing our Advent celebration this morning. You know, Advent is a word that means arrival. And we are anticipating the arrival, uh, the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we lit the prophecy candle reminding us that Jesus' birth was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Today we light the angel's candle. Angels are integral to the Christmas story, and I appreciate to Sheila and Shirley leading us during this time of worship. Uh, I'll be reading in the first chapter of Luke, verses 26 through 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. <clears throat> but when he saw, she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will receive in your womb, conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Today we light the angel candle symbolizing the fact that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and announced not only the Messiah the Messiah's impending birth but also her significant place in that event. Angels fill several different roles in God's ongoing plan for His people, but primarily they serve as messengers. <coughs> Angels are not to be worshipped, but we would do well to follow their example in delivering messages of good news throughout our world. May each of us leave this place as messengers, messengers of the good news that Christ is born.
responsively with me. Once we were like Mary, totally unaware of the Messiah and his plan for our lives. There are many Marys out there, hoping against all hope for a glimmer of good news. We, we want to be messengers of that good news, impacting the dark world with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, amen. Thank the Lord. Thank you, ladies, for sharing with us this morning. Let's stand as we sing that wonderful song, Joy of the World. <laughs>
church downtown years ago, and I said I've got to have that song. And so I appreciate my good friend Amy Vaughn in Greenfield recording this for me on this CD. So. Mary was the first to hear it. to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, 
being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want my prayer to echo the words of what we just say. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us today. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to admit to you, I'm not the most observant guy in the world. I could cite several examples, but this one leaps out. When I worked at the hospital, I would go through the emergency department every day, sometimes twice a day, just to say hello and kind of see what was going on. There was a nurse there of whom I was very fond, and we chatted almost every day. One day I was talking to her, and I said to her, there is something different about you. You've changed your hair. She said, oh no. I said, yeah, you have changed the color of your hair. She said, no, I haven't. And I kept pressing her, what is different about you? She finally said, well, the only thing that's different, uh, I got my braces off a couple of months ago. <laughs> I was just now noticing that she had gotten her braces off. And, you know, you sort of smile about that. But I think a lot of us are guilty of the very same thing. We just don't really pay attention to what we see. Well, let me test you this morning. Every one of you, close your eyes, if you will. Every head bowed, every eye closed. What color is my tie? Well, some of you are better than I thought. Okay. Think about the person sitting next to you. You don't have to answer out loud. What is that person wearing? Might be your spouse and your child or a parent. I see some of you peeking. <laughs> what is the person next to you wearing? Okay, look up. I bet three-fourths of you could not answer that question correctly. Even though, you know, if it's a spouse... You, uh, you know, got dressed, you came to church together, you sat together in Sunday school, but you just didn't notice what he or she has on. You know, the Christmas story is sort of similar to that. We have seen it so many times. We have preached it so many times. We have nativity scenes all over the house. But have we really stopped and taken a long, hard look at the story of Jesus' birth. You know, my challenge this, this morning, how to say something that, that might bring light to something you already know. I, I've got to tell you, I'm not going to plow any new ground this morning. I'm not going to give you some new insight that you've never had before. But I, I remember something a professor of mine said one time, he said the, the average American has to hear something 22 times before it becomes part of their permanent psyche. Maybe you've only heard it 21 times. So I'm going to preach it for the 22nd time and try to just draw out some new truths. I, I guess there's one word that uh, wraps up or sums up the Christmas story. It is the word simplicity. 100 years ago, people could relate to the Christmas story. But now, people find it impossible to relate. Now we have ultrasounds. You, you can know what your child looks like a month before he or she is born. Now we have gender reveal parties. I think it's more fun just to wonder and be surprised once the child arrives, but, but I've been dragged to several gender reveal parties. You know, now we have birthing suites uh, at the hospital in Union City. All 
all of the birthing suites were, were two luxurious rooms with a bathroom that might rival anything you find at the Hilton. It was absolutely magnificent, wonderful surroundings for a baby to be born. Nowadays, we have 24-hour dismissal. You know, within one day after the birth of the baby, you're on your way out. When I was born, my mother was in the hospital eight days with me, and mine was just a normal birth as far as I know. But things are so dramatically different. Used to, you would send out birth announcements. Nowadays, you put it on Instagram or Twitter, and all the world knows within three seconds. When's the last time you've gotten a birth announcement? I bet we haven't gotten one in, in 25 years because they're, they're just not necessary anymore. The birth process is so different than it was 100 years ago and especially 2,000 years ago. At one time, the Sultan of Brunei was the wealthiest man. There's his picture. The wealthiest man in the world. He has an estimated worth of $40 billion. He owns 90 mansions spread out all over the world. He has a fleet of 200 Rolls Royces. He has 13,000 personal servants who wait on him hand and foot. He owns four 747 jets. He can be anywhere in the world in 12 hours. Let me tell you about the birth of his firstborn son. He was born in 1971. For, for the purpose of that birth, the Sultan of Brunei flew in an 11-member team of obstetricians from Harvard University. Uh, the Sultan added a 17,000 square foot wing onto his favorite mansion so the baby would not feel cramped or crowded. He put $3 billion in a trust fund for that baby. Uh, he bought two hours of television time in order to show home movies of the baby right after he was born. He arranged for a $2 million fireworks display to uh, be exhibited above the hospital where the baby was born. It was abruptly canceled when it woke the baby up and the baby started crying. Now, that is one lucky baby. Wouldn't you like to be born into such wealth and, and affluence? I just cannot help but compare that birth with the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one of whom it said he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, the Light of the World, the High Priest, the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of our faith, the chief cornerstone, the indescribable gift, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Rock, the Resurrection, and the Life, the Bread of Life, the Good Shepherd. I just can't help but compare those two. Jesus' birth was just two teenagers in a cave out by themselves in the middle of nowhere. Now, we can't relate to that here in affluent America, but did you know that 85% of the world's babies were born at home? Uh, probably some of you were born at home. Uh, in the entire world population, 70% of expected mothers give birth without any medical accompaniment at all. It is just them and perhaps a sister or a neighbor, and that's all. Now, back to the original topic, God's nativity activity. What can we say? What are some truths I can draw out for you? Number one, I want you to notice with me, God uses little people. He 
He uses little people. In 2002, there was a woman named Linda Green who lived in Pueblo, Colorado. At the age of 29, she was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. And she was given just a couple of months to live. Linda Green at the time had a husband and two small children. She did something that I've never heard of before or since. As soon as she was diagnosed and, and given that grim prognosis, she started a statewide search for a new wife for her husband and a new mother to her children. She took out over 40 personal ads looking for someone to marry my husband and raise my children. Two days before she died, as her family was standing there beside her, a woman walked through the door and she said, this is the woman I have chosen to raise my children. Now, that is not something you would do lightly, is it? That's not something you would just decide on a whim. That is the, the biggest decision of your life. And you are entrusting the most precious thing in the world to someone whom you really don't know. Now, that is God's challenge here in the story. God is entrusting His only Son to an earthly couple. Someone who would raise his son in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Anthrop anthropologists estimate that at the time of Jesus' birth, the world's population was 300 million. Of those 300 million, God settled on Joseph and Mary. If that doesn't emphasize how godly and special and unique they were, I don't know what would. But they were an unlikely couple. They were teenagers from a, a backwoods town. They had humble backgrounds, no wealth, no education, no pedigree. They weren't even religious leaders. Now we know that they were faithful to the Word of God. But they weren't ordained. You know, they didn't work full time at the synagogue. They were just simple teenagers who lived very modest lifestyles. And you know, that shouldn't surprise us. Because the story from Genesis to the maps, the story is of how God uses seemingly insignificant people to accomplish His purposes. Who would have thought a young shepherd boy, in fact, he was so young and so unlikely that he remained in the fields while his brothers paraded before the king. Who would have thought that young shepherd boy? Bible says he had a ruddy complexion. That's just another way of saying he was covered in acne. Who would have thought that young shepherd boy would kill the giant Goliath and would become the greatest king in Hebrew history? Who would have thought a middle-aged man with a speech impediment and a criminal record would be the liberator who would lead God's people out of bondage in Egypt? Who would have thought an elderly widow who hobbled into the temple treasury and dropped a couple of pennies into the receptacle. Who would have thought she would be cited as an example of sacrificial giving? Who would have thought the very first evangelist would be a bunch of unnamed shepherds on a hillside? The Bible says they went and they, they investigated firsthand. And then they went out proclaiming the good news all over the land. That is the story of Scripture, of how God uses little people, how God uses nobody, so to speak, and makes somebodies out of them. Now, we know that there's, in God's economy, we know that nobody is a nobody. 
We know that everyone is significant, but as far as the world is concerned, God specializes in taking people who are marginalized by society and using them in a great way. People who were just neglected and cast aside. God has a way of lifting them up and, and using them in a marvelous way. Let me tell you about Jesse. Jesse was born in a small backwoods holler in West Virginia. Uh, the house did not have running water until he was 13. The house did not have electricity until he was grown and moved off. Jesse's father was a brute of a man. 6, 9, and 300 pounds. He was an alcoholic who made his own moonshine. At least once a week, he would come home drunk and would physically and verbally abuse the entire family. He gave Jesse ten broken bones by the time he was five years old. Jesse's older brother was a bully who stabbed him three times before he was old enough to start school. Uh, once Jesse started to school, he was the smallest one in his class. He was the one everyone bullied. They would trip him. They would knock the books out of his arms. They would spill his food all over him while he was trying to eat. At age 10, his father said, it's time for you to go to work. And I've arranged for you to become a chicken plumber at the local chicken processing plant. So he would go after school and work 12 hour shifts for 22 cents an hour. Jesse couldn't wait to get away from home. He dropped out of school, eventually finished his GED. But when World War II broke out, he decided this is my chance to break away. He joined the army, was immediately sent to Europe. While he was there, he earned seven medals for bravery and, and courage under fire. While there, Jesse discovered he had a, a knack for making people laugh. He would do comedy routines and, and they would come from miles away to hear Jesse tell jokes. Well, that kind of bolstered his confidence. He got out of the army, decided that he would be the first member of his family to go to college. Jesse earned a bachelor's and a master's degree from West Virginia University. While there, he discovered he had a flair for acting. And he performed in all sorts of school plays and people loved him and he became a hero on campus finally decided that he would head to California and see what lie, uh, lay before him. Well, to make a long story short, the Jesse of, of whom I speak is Jesse Donald Knox. <laughs> Barney Fife. There's his picture. You talk about somebody who was considered a nobody. Nobody in the entire community thought he would amount to anything. They thought he would pluck chickens till the day he died. But God raised him up and gave him this talent. And he became what is arguably the most beloved actor and, and comedian of all time. There's not a day that goes by that I don't watch at least a snippet of the Andy Griffith show. Thank God we have that to watch as a family. There's very little we can watch together. But we can watch Andy Griffith. And it all started with Jesse the chicken plug. So just to reiterate what I said, God uses little people. This morning you might feel like, you know, I'm very insignificant. They don't care if I live or die. Nobody notices me. I want you to notice you, to know you have the potential for greatness if you will allow 
the Lord Jesus Christ to take full possession of you and you'll just place yourself at His disposal that you'll salute and say, private first class, fill in the blank, reporting for duty. So God uses little people. Number two, God uses little places. You know, Bethlehem is a word that means the house of bread. That gives us some, some insight in the type of community Bethlehem was. It was a stopover for pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. Even though it was only nine miles outside of Jerusalem, that was a day's journey. So people would stop and they would find a place to spend the night. They would find something to eat. And the next morning they would pack up and move on without giving any thought to the little place where they had spent the night. Bethlehem had an unsavory reputation because a lot of travelers passed through there. It was a haven for bandits and robbers. And they would just uh, terrorize people who passed by on their way to Jerusalem to, to worship or conduct business. You know, on, on top of that, even the Bible describes Bethlehem as a small and insignificant place. Micah 5 and verse 2, which is uh, the Bible's prophecy of the birthplace of the Messiah, even says, Bethlehem, even though you're small and, and insignificant and you're from the smallest tribe of Israel, out of you shall come a governor who shall rule the world. You know, add to all of that Joseph and Mary, you know, if Mary gave birth to that child in a, in a cave somewhere or a stable, we really don't know which, but it was in all likelihood a cave. I've been to Bethlehem. It is in the Palestinian controlled area. We had to go through barrier after barrier after barrier to go and, and visit Bethlehem. It took two hours to get through security, but I was bound and determined that I was going to view the spot where Jesus was born. They showed us the shepherd's fields and there were all these caves out there. And they said, our best guess is that Jesus was born in one of them. But I want you to know that small and insignificant city was the place where God robed Himself in human flesh, came and dwelt among us, that He might seek and to save that which was lost. Is there anybody in here who has ever heard of a place called Blananerk, Wales? Blananerk, Wales. I have tried to find it myself when I was in school in England. And it's, it's not on a map anywhere. Uh, they say the population of uh, Blanenert is about 80. Uh, I think they're kind of exaggerating. That might be ministerially speaking. It's probably more like about five. But I want you to know what happened in Blanenert, Wales in 1904. This is a woman whose name has been largely forgotten. But you would do well to remember her image and her name. Her name was Flory Evans. She was a new believer. At that time, Wales was, was considered the darkest place spiritually in the entire world. Only 1% considered themselves to be believers. Less than 2% ever went to church. One night, Flory Evans went to a gathering of youth in a town hall in Blandenert, Wales. They were just sort of chatting as teenagers do, and she stood up in the midst. She said, I want all of you to know I love God with every fiber of my being. Now, the Spirit of God took those words and ignited a prayer meeting that lasted there for three days. People came from miles around because they heard what was happening there in Blanenert. 
And again, to make a long story short, the great Welsh revival began in that very room with that very testimony of Flory Evans. That revival saw over 2 million people come to faith in Christ. Every bar in the country except one shut down. And the one that remained open made a profit of six cents that year. Every policeman in the country was laid off. There was no crime, so there was no need to have any law enforcement at all. Every judge lost his job, so judges formed gospel quartets, and they would stand on the street corner singing the praises of God. In fact, so widespread was the revival in Blandenburg that there was a, a marked decrease in coal production. You know, Wales is built on coal. And it became wealthy through the production of coal. But there was a marked decrease, and this is why. So many coal miners were coming uh, to faith in Christ, and they were changing their vocabularies. The beast of burden, they were used to being screamed at and cursed and beaten. And when these miners came to faith in Christ, everything changed. And they started speaking kindly to those animals. And they encouraged them and, and patted them and treated them like companions rather than just Beasts who were designed to work all day. And the beast didn't know how to relate to that. They weren't used to it. So there was just a dramatic decrease in coal production. All of that started in an out of play or out, uh, out of the way place called Blandenburg, Wales. You know, Brownsville, Tennessee is, you know, it's well known here in the western part of the state. Uh, the eastern part, who knows? I guess the folks from Elizabethton may know a little bit about us, but you know, outside the state of Tennessee, there are probably not very many, many people who know that Brownsville even exists. But just as it happened in Blanner, just as it happened in Bethlehem, revival can come. God can visit us in an unusual way, the fires of heaven can fall even this morning. So God uses little people and God uses little places. But finally, notice with me, God uses little problems. In Luke 2, we are introduced to Caesar Augustus. Now, he was a real piece of work. He was the son of Julius Caesar. You remember reading Julius Caesar by Shakespeare in high school? Julius Caesar had several children, but Augustus was his favorite. And he groomed Augustus to follow him as emperor. Well, you remember what happened to Julius Caesar? He was stabbed by his trusted companions on March 15th. With his death, there was a, a vacuum. And two men wanted to be the emperor. Caesar Augustus, obviously, and Mark Antony. Mark Antony was distracted with his Egyptian girlfriend, Cleopatra. So finally, he kind of fell out of favor, and Augustus Caesar became the emperor. He's regarded as one of the cruelest men who ever squatted on the Roman throne. He was bloodthirsty. And he was greedy. Loved money. Loved squeezing people for every last dime. And one of his first official acts, uh, acts was to, to declare that a, a tax be levied upon the entire known world. Romans in those days were allowed to use any means fair or foul to extract tax money from people. They could torture people. They could confiscate property. They could confiscate, confiscate children and sell them into slavery. 
And that is what Caesar Augustus imposed. Furthermore, it was required that everyone return to the place where their family's lineage began. David, because, or excuse me, Joseph, because he was the house of the house and lineage of David, was forced to go to Bethlehem. Along with him, he was required to take his legal wife, Mary. Now, they weren't married physically. There was no intimacy between them. Mary was a literal, physical virgin, but in the eyes of the law, they were married. They were betrothed, which simply means in the eyes of the law, they were living as husband and wife, and they had to jointly come and register and pay their taxes. Now, from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 90 miles. Nazareth is about 80 miles north of Jer Jerusalem, right on the border with Samaria. Bethlehem is about 10 miles south. So it was a 90-mile journey. Under the best of circumstances, it would have been a two-week trek. On that journey, they would cross at least three mountain ranges and two rivers. This was in the spring, probably in, in April. You know Jesus wasn't born on December 25th, probably born in the spring because the, uh, the flocks were out. But at that time of the year, the daytime temperature would have been about 95. And the nighttime temperature would have been around 55. You know, add to that, Mary was nine months pregnant. You know, even today, uh, women that far along in a pregnancy are, are discouraged from traveling. But here she had to make a two-week journey, two weeks there, two weeks back. That's a month that she was required to be away from her family and those who would care for her. You know, think about how people would react today. They would riot. They would loot, they would scream, they would refuse to do that. They would let their voices be known. We're not going. We're not paying. We're not obeying. They would just protest loudly and vociferously. But in those days, nobody did. They just meekly and gently went along with every Roman decree. So Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem. You know, we see this as a, a curveball for, for them. Here they were anticipating becoming man and wife physically. I can imagine Joseph perhaps building a little home where they would live and, and raise a family. They find themselves away from home, away from everything they've ever known away from family and friends and, and security and familiarity. But you know what that did? That forced them to absolutely depend upon God. They realized this is not something we can do alone. This is going to require divine favor, divine strength, divine intervention. You know, those little problems in your life, or maybe those big problems in your life, they are designed to drive you to your knees and to force you to deepen your dependence upon God. So many times when problems arise, we, we dig deep into our reservoir. We think, man, I can just muster up the strength. I can do this. I can depend upon my own wits and ingenuity. They ought to force us to increase dependence upon God. But it's rare that we do so. There are times in all of our lives that God must deal seriously with us in order to bend our will, in order to reshape us into the image and the, the project, the workmanship that He is creating from our lives. So God uses little people 
God uses little places and God uses little problems. Properly used, those problems can become a vessel by which you can praise God and be more usable in His hand. Even Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we have the sentence of death on us that we should not trust in ourselves but God. I love Isaiah 43. When you walk through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord your God. So let's do a little math this morning. Little people, little places, little problems equals the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The greatest miracle in human history when God came to the earth robed himself in human flesh, lived among us so that he could relate to us and identify with our needs and concerns. This morning, there are some of you who need to reorder your lives. Some of you just need to come and press your nose into the carpet here and say, God, my priorities have gotten askew. The things that are important to me are not the things that are important to you. The things that are important to you are not the things that are important to me. I'm living for myself, my own lust and my own desires and my own greed. And I want to come to you in a fresh moment of surrender and submit myself and, and prostrate myself on the altar of sacrifice and, and service. Some of you need to come trust in Christ as your Savior. You know, how can anybody say no to such a gracious offer? Christmas morning, you're going to wake up and there is going to be a gift with your name on it. What are you going to do? Are you just going to sit there and stare at it for the next six months? Are you going to say, well, you know, I, I, I just don't think I'll like it. I don't know what it is, but I don't think I'll like it. So, you know, just chuck it in the trash can. None of you will do that. You will run up there and tear into it. Don't worry about saving the wrapping paper. That's Only cheapskates do that. Just rip it to pieces. That's what you're going to do with your gift. Well, you know, salvation is no different. You can stare at it. You can tiptoe around it. You can delay it as long as you... Uh, think is necessary, but you must come to the point where you unwrap it and appropriate it for your own life. Maybe others of y'all are coming tonight with our Papa Cora family. We'd love to have you come and invest your lives as, as we invest our life in you. We pledge to you that we're going to become your family and we're going to look after you in, in times of joy as well as in times of sorrow. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of commitment. Brother John's going to come and lead us, and the ladies are going to make their way to the instruments. And as we do every Sunday, I'm going to stand down front, and I would invite you to quickly step out and walk the aisle. Just take me by the hand. Share with me what's going on in your life. Let me pray with you. Let me rejoice with you. Let me cry with you. Whatever decision you need to make, this is the time and this is the place. Let's stand together and sing.